you. Thanks for joining us. Um, so it's going to be um, an hour and a half learning and activity as well. Um, so we should be aiming to finish about 7.30. But obviously, it's very different doing training online. So we still like, to, like it to be as interactive as possible and for you to kind of end the session feeling like you've learned new things and that you've got new ideas. So please, as we're going through, if you want to ask anything, if you've got something in mind that is working really well, you know, please feel free to share that as well. Okay, so I'll just tell you a bit about me. So my name is Shelley Smith and I'm a psychotherapist um, and I opened the Wellbeing Therapy Centre in Anstey um, in July this year. My background is in special educational needs and I kind of went down from a sixth form college as in a support role down to secondary school, down to primary, down to early years. And the reason being the passion just grew stronger for trying to support children and families as early as possible. Um, and I think, to be honest, I just used to get a bit frustrated sitting in meetings with not, you know, trying with people having a battle, trying to get help and support. And I just used to think if only there was a place where, you know, you could a one stop shop that you could go for all sorts of support. So kind of that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, within my therapeutic role, I use cognitive behavioural therapy quite a lot and creative therapy. I work with children. Um, kind of six to seven years and then young people and adults as well um, and then like I said at our therapy centre we have lots of different holistic and therapeutic support as well but I'll give you some more details about that at the end so you've got my email address if you do have any questions as well and I think you will get these slides I can email these slides over so you can get a copy of them but obviously please feel free to make any notes as we go through Okay, so you may have had mental health training before, you may have had um, different sessions on well-being, physical activity, how it's linked to mental health, but we're going to be covering well, what is mental health, how we can support emotional well-being in the early years. Am I right, so you both work with early years at the moment, or is it a mixture of ages? A mixture for me, yeah. A mixture. Yeah, and I, I, although, yeah, it's a mixture still, because, yeah, we work holistically with families. Fantastic. Um, so we're going to be doing a little creative emotional support activity and also looking at a self-regulation, high intensity training workout. So I won't be getting you to jump up and do a Joe Wicks, but we'll just be giving some information about different things that can be linked to mindful movement as well. Have, have either of you done any mindfulness at all before? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. So you'll be aware of what mindfulness is. If you haven't, then that's absolutely fine. We'll be, we'll be talking through some kind of tricks and tips about how to work on breathing techniques and just kind of reconnect the body and the mind, because that's obviously important with mindful movement. Okay. So Lucy's been through kind of the um, code of conduct, so we don't need to go through that. Okay. So what is mental health defined as? So it's a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I just feel like, oh, if only we could be like that all day, every day, wouldn't that be absolutely lovely? <laughs> But obviously, as we know, especially this year, life can throw some difficult things at us and it's not always plain sailing. And um, we need to have kind of that resilience and those um, social and emotional skills and also those tips, like we were saying, to try and manage those difficult emotions. But I just wanted to bring in the five ways to well-being, which was brought in by the NHS a few years ago. So you might be aware of these. Um, but I always think it's good to revisit these because you can in incorporate these with support for any age group. So connection, that's obviously huge, especially this year. Um, and in the second lockdown, you know, it's really important for our mental health and well-being that we can still have that feeling of connection and that sense of belonging. Keeping learning, so doing things like we're doing today, you know, we never have reached the point where we know everything. So it's really good for that motivation and that drive system to keep learning and gaining knowledge about things that you're interested in, especially in the kind of jobs that we're in, where a lot of the time we're supporting other people's emotions. So it's really important to keep up with what's out there. Taking notice. So this is obviously about being mindful and just being present which sometimes, you know, especially when things can feel a bit overwhelming and busy, you know, you can drive to work and you can get there and think, I actually can't remember getting here. I don't remember the journey. 
or you can pick your cup of tea up and you drank it and you didn't realize um so just taking notice and being present can really support our mental health and well-being because it kind of stops us worrying about the future so all those what ifs and also focusing on the past so it just allows us to pause those thoughts that are whizzing around and just to be present in the moment where actually in this very second we're okay we're safe and we can cope so giving so that's you know we know how it feels when people give us things and it's really kind and it gives us that warm feeling but actually showing other people kindness and compassion and especially like we said in the jobs that you're both in you're doing this all the time um so actually being kind to others is good for our mental health and then the one that we're focusing on mainly today you know it's about being active we know that physical health and mental health goes alongside each other you can't have one without the other being active is different for different people, different age groups, different abilities, but it's really important to still have that connection kind of with nature, even if it's, you know, going for a walk, walking the dog. You know, some people's active routine might be going to the gym three times a week. Some people, it might be in ordinarily, ordinary circumstances, you know, part of a football team or rugby team. Um, and again, there's a sense of loss there for a lot of people at the moment because, all the things that we used to do for distraction, for our mental health, for our well-being, for our self-care, you know, a lot of them have gone at the moment. So there is a lot of sense of grief and loss. And it's important to just try and be active and to have, do all these other steps as, as often as we can, really, and just build them into each day. So I'm not going to go through the facts and figures because I know we've got a lot to go through, but we know that these are increasing, you know, when you hear you know, mental health foundation reports, especially around, um, you know, young children and even suicide to a certain extent, you know, with male suicide and things like that. At the moment, anxiety is intensified. Um, the need for support is there and there is a lot of awareness, a lot of funding being um, put into mental health support at the moment. And hopefully even through the work that we're doing, you know, we, it can go towards reducing some of these figures as well and supporting other people. So just thinking about the risks and triggers um, of kind of poor mental health or when people experience mental health difficulties, you know, it can be anything. It can be a traumatic experience that has happened or it could be, you know, things that are happening in life. Like obviously we know that coronavirus is a trigger to mental health. Um, difficulties and having those really difficult emotions. Um, special educational needs and disability as well is, is one of the risks and triggers. If you have children who have felt, you know, behind their peers or who have struggled physically or academically, you know, that does affect a person's self-worth, it does affect a person's self-esteem and it will lead to some of those difficult emotions that we experience at the same time. But I just wanted to put this in about adverse childhood experiences because it's always useful to, to learn about adverse childhood experiences and, and just understand it, the importance of being aware of this really, that um, the research shows that the more traumatic events people have before the age of 18, you know, that is going to impact on their well-being. And the, the more ACEs they have, the more likely it is that they, they might struggle or they might need support in other areas in the future. And when we're talking about ACEs, um, they're kind of put into these different categories. So we've got household challenges. So it could be domestic violence, could be substance abuse, mental illness within the household, parental separation and divorce or maybe a, maybe a parent has had to go into prison or, you know, they're in the court system or something like that. But it's not to say that if your parents separate, you're going to have a mental health disorder. It's just to have this awareness in the back of your mind, really, a bit like that hamster wheel that's ticking over. But if you are supporting children or families and you're thinking, actually, you know, I remember looking at those ACEs and this family's got quite a lot, you know, that is going to impact on the way that child's brain works, the way they see the world, the way they see themselves um, and obviously abuse and neglect as well if they've experienced anything like that any traumatic um, adversity then that again is going to be a risk and a trigger for mental health difficulties. I just wanted to mention as well when we talk about loss it doesn't always have to be connected with you know 
the sad kind of uh, death of a loved one or, or a friend or family member, loss and the grief that you can feel through loss is, you know, something that can be difficult to manage. And like we've said this year, there is a lot of loss for many people, um, especially if we think about our daily routine, there's loss of structure, loss of connection, maybe loss of confidence, loss of independence, things like that. So you might find that some of, some of the children that you're working with, you know, they might seem very angry. They might seem like they've regressed in age. Um, they might not be able to focus the same. So all of those things kind of play a part as well at the moment. And obviously there's some other risks and triggers there. So when we're thinking about mental health, we're thinking about our feelings and our emotions. You may have seen this emotion wheel before, but this just shows you that there are tons of emotions. It's not as simple as, you know, happy, sad, angry, worried. It's about looking beneath the feeling, beneath the kind of facial expressions and the behaviours that we see to really understand at a deeper level what's actually going on. So I always find that this tool, again, is useful to have in your mind, just so that you can kind of think, well, if your child is kind of portrayed as a very angry child, you know, maybe they feel quite frustrated, maybe they feel humiliated, maybe they feel criticised. Um, so yeah, this is just something else to have in the back of your mind, just to be aware if you are supporting children that are experiencing, you know, emotional difficulties at the moment. So in your settings, I don't know, do you go into families' homes or is it mainly, do they come to you or how does it work normally? Um, not me personally, but the other Pado in my position, uh, she uh, goes into other people's homes. Uh, we've done stuff in schools as well before, so yeah, quite varied. Yeah. So obviously from a, from a setting approach, you know, you want to be shouting from the rooftops what you're doing to support mental health and wellbeing. Um, that can be obviously through displays and things like that, but actually the emotional support that we give our children, you know, we can be using lots of emotional literacy tools. There are so many books that can be adapted to support people with their emotions. Even if they're really, you know, young and they're maybe two years old, if they can't read that book, that doesn't necessarily matter because obviously in the early years, children are kind of relying on people's facial expressions and their body language and visually what they see. So it's about starting that early, really. And obviously, then you can adapt those books and those lit that literacy into different craft ideas, sensory play, messy play. You know, that's really important for the brain development. And a lot of settings in schools, they've had to stop all that at the moment because obviously they can't they have children touching the same things. Um, but we need to be thinking outside the box a bit and think if we completely take away that sensory and um you know, messy play, then that part of the brain that develops the emotional side is, is not going to be functioning as it should. So we need to be trying to encourage that. And if we can get children outside and doing physical activity, you know, we can really bring those senses in. So bringing those mindfulness activities where we're focusing on how the body feels, what sounds we can hear, you know, what can we see around us? It's good for grounding, good for anxiety management, but it's also good for that emotional brain development as well. And obviously what we do need to do is we're building this trusted relationship with these children we work with and we want them to be able to come to us if they are struggling, if they're worried, if they want to communicate that they're, you know, experiencing any difficulty. So having an outlet for that is really important as well. Um, so it's difficult for children to sometimes say how they're feeling when they might not even know. If they haven't had that support with emotional vocabulary, they might not even be able to communicate that to you. So they might not be able to say, you know, I'm feeling a bit worried or I'm feeling nervous or something happened this morning and I'm feeling a bit angry. It's about trying to adapt things to different ages, but just normalizing emotions all of the time. And I'm always trying to emphasize that is a really important part of, of mental health and well-being. It's just about you know, children shouldn't be made to feel guilty because they feel nervous or anxious or angry even. You know, anger is not socially acceptable, you know, because it's associated with things like hitting or biting or not sharing or kicking or whatever. But when children or adults feel angry, all it normally is is when they feel like they've not been heard. So that's another thing, you know, another important thing just to have in your mind that if they're feeling like they've not been heard, you know, how can you listen? How can you actively spend that time with them just to, to notice what's going on? 
and even to try and support them in, in picking up those feelings early and you know saying to children oh I'm you know I'm noticing that your your legs moving or I'm noticing that you feel you, you, your breath's getting faster you know they might not be able to say but you can actually support them in recognizing those emotions at a really early age we will talk a bit more about self-regulation as well in a bit Okay, so just thinking about how the brain works, because obviously we're talking about physical health, but we're also talking about mental health. And we've said you can't have one without the other. So you might have already had training and workshops and things around the neuroscience of how the brain works, but I'm just gonna revisit it because when anybody experiences increased anxiety or anger, that prefrontal cortex at the front so the bit that does all the thinking and all the logical thoughts and making a plan. So thinking, oh, I might be late. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this and do this. You know, the bit that makes you feel in control. When that anxiety kicks in or that anger and that brain is flooded with cortisol or adrenaline, that thinking part of the brain shuts down completely. So it purely acts in, in a survival mode. So we haven't got time to think about oh, you know, the fire alarm's going off. I wonder where the fire's come from. Oh, did somebody burn the toast? What's happening? We haven't got time to think. We need to not think in order to survive. So that's why a child won't be able to think straight if they're angry or if they're really, really anxious. You know, they might be repeating themselves over and over again or asking for reassurance or even getting really frustrated. You know, that thinking part has gone. So there's no point at that stage saying, you know, calm down or why did you do this? Or we don't do this here. That's not acceptable. They won't even be able to hear you. So once that kind of emotional brain kicks in and it's flooded with those stress chemicals, a child or an adult is going to go into fight, flight. And it doesn't say it here, but the other one is freeze. So as I'm talking about it, you might recognize it in some of the children that you've worked with before, where they kind of behave in a certain way or they're saying something in a certain way. And you think, actually, that, that does make sense now. Um, so if that anxiety has triggered that anxiety alarm and the threat systems kicked in and the person's thinking, no, I can't do that. Everyone's going to laugh at me. I can't play that sport. I'm absolutely rubbish at it. You know, I didn't score a goal last week. I can't do it then their flight system is triggered because all they want to do is ring up and say, I'm not going, I'm ill, or they're going to stall. And the parents are trying to get them out the door and they won't put the shoes on or they're messing around with something else. You know, They're going to do anything in their power to not put themselves into that, what they perceive is a dangerous situation. But what sometimes happens is our anxiety doesn't know if it's a massive crocodile in the garden, not that that happens, or it's going into the co-op or going to a spelling test or going to sleep. Our brain gets confused, you see. So we have to try and bring that sense of safety back for the child to feel trusted and safe and into a place where they can feel relaxed so that thinking part of the brain can switch back on. The other one is fight. So again, if that threat alarm is going off and the child is thinking, I can't do this, I'm in danger, you know, this is not good for me, they're going to go into fight mode and they might get aggressive, they might get frustrated. Again, they might do anything that they can to kind of what's seen as misbehave to get out of that situation. So I think a bit like with the ACEs, it's also useful to have this in the back of your mind because as you're working with children, you'll be able to recognize if there's been a sudden trigger, or maybe this happens at a certain point of the day. Maybe it happens when it's PE or it's unstructured time where they've got to go into circle time or they've got to go outside and play with children that they've not played with before or do something that they feel like they're rubbish at. So just have that in the back of your mind as, as you're working with families and children because you might start to recognize that some of those survival modes are kicking in. Does either of you have any questions so far? Um, no, not yet. No, you're all right. Just shout up if, you, if anything comes to mind or if you want to ask anything. Okay. So sometimes what we do is we expect children to know how to self-regulate their emotions. 
So we might say to children, you know, do your breathing or calm down, or like we said, you shouldn't behave like this. But actually, until a child is kind of seven upwards, they don't really have the ability to self-regulate. They purely rely on us to co-regulate. So it's about us sitting together and teaching the child to be able to learn strategies to be able to manage those emotions. And obviously the first stage is trying to recognize in the body how they're feeling. So if you have got a child that's participating in physical activity and they're starting to feel panic, you know, we want them to recognize what panic feels like for them so that they can alert us if they're struggling because they won't be able to focus. Say if they're playing um, a game of tennis or something with a friend, but they start to feel anxious, you can't focus. You can't focus the same. You can't, sometimes it's like you've gone into a bubble. You can't even notice what's around you. So noticing the physical sensations and being able to say to somebody, actually, I'm struggling, I need your help, you know, that's going to help them to be able to regulate, regulate their emotions. So if you haven't already heard about it, Beacon House um, Therapeutic Services is a really good resource. They have lots of free downloads on the website, and it can really help you to understand um, kind of this bottom-up approach, which teaches us that first, when a child is struggling with their emotions or their mental health, what we need to do is we just need to regulate. We just need to help them find that inner calm that is going to reduce that fight, flight and freeze response. So all we need to do in that instance is just to make them feel as safe as possible. So if they're taking part in a physical activity in a big group, say, or at the moment, if it's in a smaller group that they're starting to feel anxious, you know, that fight, flight and freeze response is going to be really high. So if we keep them in that group where maybe they feel like everybody's staring at them or maybe that panic is getting worse, you know, it's going to be really hard for them to regulate. Or even if we send them off because they've been misbehaving, you know, they're, they're going to find that hard because they're on their own again. And that message is, you know, we don't want you, you're going to deal with this by yourself. And remember, you know, obviously, if they're under seven, they're probably not going to be able to. So regulating first is really important. And then relating. So we want them to feel like we're still connected. And the thing that sometimes gets missed when a child has kind of had a consequence or is experiencing difficult emotions and maybe feels like I shouldn't have behaved like that or I shouldn't feel like this, the reconnection side of it goes. So they might get the consequence, but then the person doesn't reconnect with them. So it, they kind of get that message that, you know, I've misbehaved and, you know, they don't like me anymore or they're not going to help me. They're not going to support me. So even if they have done something, you know, against the rules or, or been angry or whatever, it's really important to still reconnect with that child. So it's unconditional. You know, we want to give them the message that, Yes, you, you follow the rules, we have consequences, but at the same time, no matter what you feel, I'm here for you. So we want them to have that secure attachment with us right from an early age. And then once you've done those two things, you know, that's when the reasoning part comes in. So that's where we can be saying, you know, when we're part of this team, you know, we don't do that. That's not one of the rules. This is what you need to do if you feel, you know, angry or frustrated or you start to feel a bit nervous the reasoning part needs to come after. Because if you think about that logical part of the brain, that's when it's switched back on again. So it's not until later that you need to be doing that section. But hopefully just even having that awareness will be another thing, you know, back of the mind that helps you to support children and families. And if you're supporting parents as well, sometimes it can be useful to share this with them because we're not, you know, we don't get taught this stuff. And it's really important um, because if we're thinking about mental health, it's all about the brain, isn't it? Alongside the body, but it's all happening in there. So we need to try and raise that awareness of what happens in the brain so that they understand that it's not them going mad and going crazy. It's actually their brain trying to protect them. Obviously, environment is really important too. So if you're in a setting, if you're going into a school and you're supporting a child with their mental health and well-being, you want it to be a nice, cosy, nurturing environment. Obviously, a lot of settings have, again, had to get rid of a lot of these things, you know, cushions and blankets and things like that. But 
it's really important to think about the environment and especially if you're doing physical activity and sports outside you know it might be that that child does need some time you know five minutes away from that busy outside environment especially if it's quite noisy you know a lot of their sports and activities will be either in a playground or in a hall where things are echoing and if you think about when anxiety and anger kicks in, your senses are all heightened. So noise is louder, you know, the texture of things is harsher. So it's really important to just recognise the environment that they're in as well. OK, so I'm just going to get you to do a little activity. So I sent through this body template. You might have it there. If you don't, you can just draw yourself a little gingerbread man on a piece of paper. Oh, look, they're cute. <laughs> Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> and if you've got any colours, you don't, again, you don't have to have colours, but if you have, it might be a bit easier. So I've just got my colours here. Um, if you haven't got colours, you can just write the colour that you're using. Okay. So this is a really good activity to do with children and families and it might look like it's quite um, early years, primary age, but I actually use this with adults as well, because we have to think about going right back to emotional literacy, right back to emotional vocabulary. You might get somebody, you know, in their 40s, 50s, but they might have never done this work. They might have never have sat and thought, actually, how does it feel when I'm really angry? How does it feel when I'm really nervous or scared? People don't generally do it. So if we can be teaching it from the early years, they're going to have that as those life skills. So the first column, it says emotion. So you don't have to do this personal to you. You might want to, or you can just make it up. So obviously, when we're talking about mental health and well-being, just be conscious of, you know, what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Um, and just have that personal responsibility, really, and that safety of, of, you know, if it is triggering anything for you, then obviously take a step back and just think about something else, a different kind of feeling. But I put, I put these colour monster pictures up. Hopefully you can see those. And this is from the book Colour Monster. And it's an amazing book. And it really helps children to understand that there are lots and lots of different emotions. It's done by colour, which is always helpful. And it breaks it down into how it's linked to the body how the person might be thinking, how they might be feeling, and how they might be behaving as well. And that's another thing that is, is good to remember is that you can't have one without the other. So if you think something happy, you're going to feel calmer, probably excited or happiness, and your body's going to feel relaxed as well. If you're, if you're thinking, I'm no good, I'm rubbish, everybody hates me, that's gonna be very different in the body. So the physiological sensations are gonna be a lot different. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you to choose four different emotions. It can be basic ones, you can do different ones. I'm just going to do it at the same time on mine. So in your emotion column, you're just going to write the emotion. And if you can, choose a different colour for each feeling. And when you work with children, it's interesting to discuss the colours that they choose as well. Has everybody got four different emotions? Yeah? Okay. Yep. And four different colours? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to think about this gingerbread person and we're going to start to think about where in the body that a person might feel this emotion. 
So I'll just give you an example. So my first emotion is happy and I chose yellow. And the reason I chose yellow because it reminds me of the sunshine and I automatically fit, think about yellow when I think of happiness. So I am just going to get my yellow pen and I'm just going to draw yellow around this gingerbread wherever I feel happiness within my body. So if you want to do the same with yours, And also it doesn't have to be the same shape, it could be whatever comes to mind. So it might be a squiggle, it might be um, a wavy kind of shape, it might be a cloud, whatever, whatever you're thinking. And then when you've done that, we're just going to think about the next emotion. And again, obviously, keep yourself safe. You know, you don't have to do it personal. You can just do it how you think that it might make somebody feel. And then when you've done that, if you want to move on to the next one. And then once you've done the third one, you can just move on to the last one. Okay. So I'm just going to share mine with you. I don't know if you can see that. So I chose different emotions. So my first one was happy and I kind of, that the shape is kind of quite wavy and quite soft and it's kind of all around the body, in the hands, in the head, face, in the heart, chest, you know, it's in those areas, but it just, it felt quite soft and quite relaxing, like a warm glow across, across the body. My next one was sad. And I was instantly drawn to drawing a sad mouth and tears, because that's kind of what I associate with feeling sad. But also the heart kind of feeling like there's like something through it, really tense, really, you know, that physical pain and discomfort that we can feel in the stomach. When you do this with children, a lot of the time it's it's mind, chest, stomach, and that's it. And you know, what you get children to do is you get them to kind of pull out any patterns or if anything stands out to them. And often those three areas are, co are covered with all different colors because that's where all those emotions are stored or where they feel them. Um, with I, my next, so my blue one was anxiety. So feeling anxious. Now this is in the mind, so more of like a squiggle in the mind. I've got this kind of like a heat coming out because I know a lot of people and even myself, you know, when you feel anxious, your breath gets faster, 
your heart rate gets faster, you get hotter, you know, you're purely in that survival mode, you just want to go. Um, and also around the heart, it was like pounding, like pounding heartbeat. Again, in the stomach, so like a, a churning feeling in the stomach. Sometimes children describe it as pterodactyls and we try and turn them into butterflies. So we try and slowly to make them a bit softer. And then also in the hands and feet as well, because especially if you go into that, that flight mode, you just want to run away or you feel twitchy or fidgety because you just want to go. And then the next one was anger. And I really wanted a red pen, but I didn't have one. So I went for pink. <laughs> and the anger was just instantly all over, like really sharp. Um, in the mind, angry eyebrows, you know, this really zigzag mouth. In the chest, throat, you know, often children will describe those difficult emotions in their throat feeling like bricks on their chest or feeling like trapped. Um, and a lot of the time we'll say, you know, you know, so that feeling sometimes where people feel a bit sad or upset and you're holding it in and it's really uncomfortable. It physically feels like you, you've got something in your throat and you can't swallow. Um, so the reason we do this is it just kind of starts to teach them how to connect their body and their mind. And like we've said, as adults, it's not something that we've necessarily done before, but I think it's really important, especially if we're supporting their physical health, because we do want them to tap into their body and to catch these emotions early so that they can use the things in their toolkit, toolkit to be able to manage them. Um, was this quite easy to do for you? Was, it, was anything quite difficult? You know, was it harder to think of some feelings than others? Uh, I think because a lot of them do overlap. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's probably quite harder than you first think. Because um, mm. obviously the majority of the motions there, they pretty much affect the whole body in one way or another. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And by do doing different colours and by putting it onto paper, it visually shows us how much our body holds and whereabouts it is which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the body and the mind to link back up. But as well, depending on the children you're working with, and like we've said, their emotional literacy, they might feel really comfortable doing this with you. They might have had the message that actually you don't talk about your feelings or your feelings aren't accepted and you know, you'd be happy. You know, you might be able to be angry, but the bit in the middle, you know, is not what we do. So some children will find this really hard, but what we're doing as kind of practitioners and people that are supporting children is we're starting to develop their awareness. And that's why using color, using the color monster or even inside out characters, because they're amazing. You know, the Disney Pixar characters broken down into anger, discuss, you know, if they're not aware of what anger is like, you know, you can show them anger as like a little clip and you know they find it quite funny you know to start with the fire coming out his head and he stamps his feet and he bangs around a lot but actually children can relate to that because that's how it feels it feels like that volcano is going to erupt any minute um so hopefully you found this little activity useful and if you're supporting children or families it can be a way to kind of just to understand their feelings a bit more and then for us to be able to put in place the support that, that they need. But also just thinking about it from kind of a, a physical exercise point of view, you know, the next step of this is actually focusing on how do these emotions impact us when we are trying to do physical exercise? Because I know that if I feel like this pink color, I'm not gonna be able to focus or take part in activities or, or go and do a team sport because I'm going to just be absolutely furious. And it's like these spikes are just going to knock everyone out the way anyway. And again, if all of this is going in the mind and your mind's whizzing around and you've got all these difficult feelings, how are you going to even think about where do I stand? What do I do? Where do I throw the ball? You can't, can you? Because you haven't got the same focus. So really important to just link the body and the mind all the time and especially if we're trying to support children on understanding the feelings okay 
And if you're working with older children, you can kind of go one step further, which is then looking at strategies. So once you've taught them how the emotions feel and they've got that awareness, you can then start to put things in that toolkit. So I might think something, I then feel a certain way, I might behave then a certain way, but what do I need to do before it gets to that stage? Who can I tell? So it could be having a sheet like this, which is just from the ELSA support website, which is another good um, resource tool if, if you want to download anything for free. Um, but this is about having those strategies to hand and thinking, well, when I notice that heat in my stomach, I know that I'm gonna go and count five or I'm gonna take myself off and tell somebody, or I just need to go and breathe or, or whatever it might be. So the next part of the workshop tonight, we're just going to be looking at mindfulness and mindful movement. Um, so I know, Sam, you said you've done some mindfulness. Have, have either of you done anything about mindful movement before? Uh, no. No. OK, that's fine. Have I've you done, I, I did some stuff, uh, I think it was last year on an early years send workshop about yoga movements for the little ones. Got some lovely cards um, for yoga movements. That was really nice as well. I've used with some families and children. Fantastic. Um, and I've also got some uh, breathing cards, which I normally send out to anyone that attends the training and they're just really useful. Sound like a bit like the yoga cards, just really quick breathing techniques that people can do. So I can always send those to you as well if you wanted to kind of have those resources. Um, but basically, mindfulness is all about, like we said, staying present, being aware of how you're feeling non-judgmentally. So not necessarily trying to change how you're feeling, but just becoming aware of it and just accepting that you feel like that, but also learning those grounding strategies to kind of make yourself feel safe, ground yourself. Um, sometimes it's a bit like dropping an anchor. You know, our thoughts are trying to drag us off to see. We don't want to go down there because that's scary and it's really annoying and it's taking up all my time and energy. I want to just drop the anchor. I just want to stop, be in the moment, and just, just stay, just stay in this moment and pause just for a moment. And sometimes I'll try and explain it to children as like having a remote control and you can just pause your mind just for a bit of a brain break and just sit and just be. And obviously as this illustration shows, mindful, completely overwhelmed, can't cope, too much going on, or just focusing on what you can see focusing on the here and now, and just putting all of those in the background for a moment. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at mindful movement and just I'll just explain about what it is and how it's a bit different to kind of normal physical exercise. Um, so sometimes there's a benefit to zoning out during exercise. So I know sometimes if I've had a bad day, I might just wanna go for a walk or I just wanna go for a jog and I don't want to necessarily think about anything. I just want to kind of zone out or I might want to think about, you know, if I was going on a nice holiday or something like that. I don't want to be present in the moment and notice my body. I just want to kind of do it as a cathartic, therapeutic thing at the end of the day or the beginning of the day. So putting on your favourite tunes, moving your body through a simple activity you don't have to think about. So like walking, running, going on the treadmill, this can actually feel like meditation for some. And often people will say that about physical activity. It's actually absolutely wonderful for the well-being, for their mental health, physical health. And it does regulate your emotions. You know, if you're running or you're on a treadmill or you're playing, taking part in a sport and it is like meditation, you're kind of expressing all those emotions you, you know you're focusing yourself all of those emotions are being regulated and you do feel better after you know you've got endorphins it's a good feeling um these activities allow your mind to roam free while your body works so your body's still working and your mind's just wandering so that's absolutely fine um however when you're too distracted so if we think about our gingerbread person and all of those emotions going on in the body, they all come with thoughts as well. So all those blue thoughts are going on and all the pink thoughts or the red thoughts are going on all at the same time. So that can cause you to obviously lose the connection to what you're actually doing. 
the magical moment of feeling your own strength and power as you exercise. So actually you lose that magical strength. You're not in control, you're just functioning. And we said, you know, you're not gonna have the same focus. You're not gonna have the same ability. There's a flow that happens when we pay attention to what we're doing in the current moment, one that we may be missing out on with those distractions. So if somebody's taking part in physical activity, but they're always distracted, they're never going to experience that mindful movement and how that feels. Um, and actually we want them to just be present in the moment and enjoy that time rather than thinking again about the past or thinking about the future. I suppose that's why um, we have such an issue, don't we, around some of our children who are on the autistic spectrum, that PE is, is such a hardship for them because the first thing, unfortunately, we ask them to do in school is change and <laughs> they don't like change. So we're asking them to put on different clothes. We're asking mm -hmm. them to go to a different place. They're going to have new rules. They don't know which activity they might be doing. Or oh, half of you go and play netball, half of you go and play football. Which one am I going to do? Which team am I going to be in? What am I going to wear? They've got all that emotion going on. They're not going to enjoy that activity. And that, and it is such a massive thing for them. Absolutely. You know? And even the change and the lack of routine or lack of structure alone is going to cause them anxiety. You know, but a lot of autistic children, they're, they've got that heightened anxiety from the moment they get up because they've got to navigate the world throughout the day, not just academically, but socially. You know, it's unpredictable, isn't it? You don't know what a child's gonna say. You don't know when that ball's gonna hit you in the face. You don't know when somebody's gonna ask you to run if you're playing rounders. It's so unpredictable and scary, especially to autistic children. You know, it's it's really hard. And, and if you've got all those emotions whizzing round, you're just going to be fight, flight or freeze, aren't you? You're just going to be in one of those survival modes because your brain's going to be going, this is bad, get out quick as you can. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for raising that because that is, it, it's so true. And that's why you do see those unstructured times, you know, are real triggers for many children. Like we said, circle time if they're younger, times when they're asked to do certain activities, if they've got to stand up or, you know, if, if a teacher for older children, if a teacher's asked them to read aloud, you know, put them on the spot. Um, a lot of children are more comfortable with adults as well because they kind of are more predictable. They, they can kind of think, well, I know they're going to be quite kind to me and I know they're not going to take things off me or push me or do anything like that or say something nasty. Whereas other children, you know, not necessarily that they mean it, but it is unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, if you can't be present in the moment, you can't focus on what you've got to do. Um, so yeah, just kind of going back to mindful movement, some people think it is complicated. You know, I've, I've worked with some people say, oh no, I can't do that. You've got to sit in a circle, cross-legged, and then you've got to learn how to do all this differently. It's, it's not like that at all. It's so not complicated. It is just about feeling your feet firmly on the floor, focusing on what you can see, focusing on what you can hear, and just dropping that anchor. So mindful movement is simply engaging in different exercises whilst focusing all of your attention, or as much as you can, because there's always that bit that keeps wondering about what's gonna happen next or what we're gonna have for my tea, you know, is trying to focus that attention as much as you possibly can on the movements of your body, as well as your breathing. So again, we don't go through life thinking, how do I breathe in certain situations? You know, when I'm, when I'm going to work, how is my breath? When I'm trying to go to sleep or whether, when I wake up at four o'clock in the morning because I've got a list of jobs, how is my breath? You know, it's, it's trying to pinpoint how your breath changes with different things that we're doing. So with physical workouts, the main objectives are normally to stay healthy to get in better physical shape or to keep active. They also normally involve speeding up. So it's about, you know, if you're measuring how far somebody can run or their speed, you know, it's about trying to beat your personal best and get faster and faster and faster. But actually mindful movement, what you're trying to do is slow down or even pause just to focus on what you're doing or at least bring your attention to that movement. 
The difference in a mindful workout is instead of zoning out of the present moment and sometimes thinking of other things, we draw our mind back to the physical activity and focus on connecting the mind and body back together, which is what we want. Because a lot of the times throughout the day, they're a bit in sync. You know, your mind's here thinking and feeling certain things and your body's behind. So once we can try and realign them, we start to feel a lot more relaxed, a lot calmer. And especially at the moment, we want to feel in control. We want to feel like, yeah, I can make a plan. I can make a list. You know, I can tell somebody if I can't do that. That's what we want to bring back. Um, a mindful workout involves paying attention to the flow that happens in our body when we're moving and the unity that exists between mind, body and breath. This union helps us to slow down and to regulate our nervous system. So if we think about those difficult emotions, a bit like a thermometer, it might have gone from happy to angry very quickly. You know, we want to be trying to focus that mind and body and breath back together so that those emotions can be regulated and then our nervous system can settle down so we can think straight and then take part in whatever we're doing does anybody from like families they've worked with or children has anyone got um obviously not given away their their identity or anything but do you when you're hearing this are you thinking actually this makes sense like i can tell you know if a child is really struggling or is anxious you know that does impact on the way they move the way they kind of behave yeah i mean this this is the the, the nub of the work i do a lot of the work i do anyway um mm. it is you know looking at behavior behavior is a form of communication or sensory yeah. so um i find with uh, a lot of the children i'm helping the families to do the emotional literacy um mm with them yeah to talk about their emotions when they're little mm -hmm. and how they feel keeping emotion diaries at night and things to to yeah. have that mo moment and sometimes it is because the parents themselves struggle mm -hmm. so it is you're, you're teaching both yeah I mean we we do well-being classes we do the gingerbread man with our mm -hmm. families a bit of CBT we do the Solihull approach it's it's yeah. all but um anything that's great to do with the children as well is is always good yeah, yeah absolutely because it, it is it's, it's trying to have that whole child approach isn't it and work with the family because you could it's like in my work I, I could work with a child one-to-one -one, which I do but I always you know embrace the family the school you know everybody who's around that child because we need to all be working together um, and like you said, sometimes families, you know, they haven't got this, they maybe don't feel comfortable with sharing their emotions, never mind trying to work out their children. So it's about supporting everybody, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so mindfulness during exercise can also bring a stronger connection to your body. So when you focus on each exercise, the muscles you're working and what you're actually accomplishing, you get more out of each exercise and each workout. So sometimes I do an activity with children where I might lift my uh, left or right hand and you move and you know, a bit like Bop It. Have you ever played Bop It? Where you have to hit and, and they have to tap, obviously before coronavirus, they would tap, you know, you'd move and you're teaching them to focus their senses to what they're seeing and what they're hearing. And their kind of score with tapping the right is so much bigger, you know, such a higher score because they're focusing all of their attention to that moment rather than just thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about something else. You, you can't have the same focus and um, you can't use those same skills and strength. Um, so better results when you focus on what you're doing, you improve the quality of your movement and as a result, the quality of your overall workout more satisfaction so when you know exactly what you're working how each exercise feels and whether you're getting the most out of each exercise you can end your workout knowing you did your best and that's also um one of the things that i find as well it's about having realistic expectations you know some people that i've worked with you know if they're part of a football team or you know especially if they're in a you know quite an intense training routine and things like that when they've had a physical injury you know the anxiety has increased so much you know they've almost been at that point where 
the health structure has changed, you know, they feel out of control and they can develop unhealthy coping strategies like over exercising or under eating, counting calories, all of those kind of things. So again, it's really important to have those realistic expectations and to just give yourself permission sometimes that if your physical health is not where it should, you know, it needs to be at that stage, then your mental health is going to be affected. So it's about trying to look at those emotions. It's the same if a child's been ill or, you know, if they've had a stint in hospital or any health conditions. Um, you know, that feeling sometimes you, you, your body wants to do things, you know, your mind is saying you can do this, you can, but you can't because your body's saying, no, I'm not up to it. But that does have an impact on your mental health because it's frustrating you can feel like you're not capable anymore and it's really knocks your confidence and self-worth as well. Okay, so with early years, I kind I try and incorporate mindful movement into a lot of the things I do. Um, one of the fun things we do is we play musical statues. So we get them to, we do a playlist and we get them to put music on and we get all the children jumping around, you know, doing their dance moves, have a little bit of a competition who can dance the best and um, strut their stuff. And then when you turn the music off, it's not just about freezing, but it's about bringing the attention to the breath. So if you imagine you, you stop, you just be, and you just notice how your breath feels you get them to notice the sensation of their breath. So whether it's warm or whether it's cold. And you also get them to notice, you know, if it's it, their mouth or their nose and, and just really tap in to kind of the body. So you get them to really understand and bring that awareness. And then you put the music back on and then they jump around again. And they notice this time whilst they're jumping around how their breath changes, how their heartbeat is, how it feels in their body. Do they feel hotter? Do their legs feel, you know, excited? And then you get them to stop again. And that can be a really fun way to bring mindful movement into supporting children, because it's a game that most children are familiar with and they like doing, but it's also just a kind of a really easy way to teach them how to be mindful. And breath is a superpower and it stays with us. So whether you're six or whether you're 16 doing your GCSEs or whether you're 66, you know, if you know that you can bring your attention to that breath and it can be used as that superpower to make you feel more in control, more relaxed, more calm, then that's something that we want to be shouting from the rooftops. Um, also things like breathing ones or, or these kind of balls that go in and out, they're really good for just focusing on how the body moves, how the breath moves. Getting children to take the shoes and socks off and going for a barefoot walk, you know, really noticing the ground, noticing the grass underneath the feet and the sensations, how it makes them feel, how it makes their body feel. And when you do this, you can really get a sense of the emotions that they're feeling because some children's face will just be like, ooh, this is horrible, I, I'd hate it. You know, like some children don't like the um, feeling of sand or water on their feet. And um, you can really kind of tap into that emotional literacy and say, oh, I'm just, I'm wondering if you're feeling like this, you know, like if you had a feeling chart or emojis, you know, really to help develop that emotional literacy. Yoga is absolutely wonderful for mindful movement. Um, if people aren't comfortable doing yoga themselves, or if you haven't got somebody to come in and do yoga, things like Cosmic Kids Yoga on YouTube is fantastic. Um, Jamie, who runs Cosmic Kids, she just has different yoga workouts with different themes. So there's a Star Wars one, and I think there's a Harry Potter one, and a, um, one that's about animals and all sorts of things. And they're just a really fun way that children can start to learn about yoga and mindfulness is incorporated into it. So they're learning how to kind of be aware of their breath and use those tools as kind of that, those brain breaks throughout the day. And especially at night time as well. Um, a lot of children at the moment are really struggling with sleep. You know, their anxiety is higher, frustration. You know, we said about that sense of loss, sadness, all of those things, you know, we know as adults, if you've got a lot on your mind or, you know, you're feeling anxious, you can't relax, you can't go to sleep. Or if you do go to sleep because you're exhausted, you wake up thinking about things. And again, what if this, what if that and the future and 
things that have happened in the past. Um, so for relaxation and, and, you know, supporting sleep, that's another really good way of, of kind of supporting families with that. Also with different routines, you know, some families have, the routines have had to change. So some families, where the, the child used to go to bed quite easily, you know, maybe they're now having to sit with the child and wait for them to go to sleep and things like that. So any of these ideas, which could, they can do together um, through that holistic approach, just to bring that sense of calm and to just be, um, is going to be really helpful. And then one of the things I always do with children is breathing buddies. Has, have, have either of you used this before? With the teddies so what you do is you get children to like so obviously at the moment we can't give teddies out but sometimes they can bring their teddy in or they can just place their hands on their tummy and what you're trying to get them to do is to just lie down and you're just going to get them to focus on how the teddy is moving so they might start to notice that their teddy is moving quite fast because maybe they've just ran to this spot and then they're laying down or maybe their teddy is moving quite relaxed, quite slow. And then you just get, get them to notice the sensation and how it feels in the breath, how it feels in the mouth, in the nose. If they can hear their heartbeat, because if your heart beats faster, sometimes it feels like an elephant stomping around your body. But this just gets them to bring their attention to how their breath is. And then you can turn it into a game. You can say, we're going to make our teddy dance really fast up and down. So get them to realize that they can actually be in control of their breath and move the teddy faster. And then you get them to slow it down. But it's empowering them that they've got this inner skill. They've got this superpower within them that actually, if they can control their breath and if they can start to realize that that breath is getting slower, their whole body feels relaxed. They feel calmer. Thinking part of the brain is back on and they can rationally think, logically think, and plan for any difficult situations. But breathing buddies is a really good one to do and, and kids really love it as well. And you can put music on um, and you can get different children, if they're a bit older, sometimes children like to lead the session. So they might say, you know, we're gonna get the teddies to move faster, slower, because that's good for their self-esteem as well. Okay, so, Obviously, I'll send you these slides so you'll get this. This is a, if you work with a group or if you're working with a whole family, you can actually get them to do this. And it is fun. You know, you can put on the music and you do a seven minute hit workout and it helps them to have that emotional regulation, you know, to have those skills that they need to be able to calm that brain down, that body down when they're feeling those really intense emotions so they're all done by little animals and sometimes I've made them into cards and we might do, not do all of them we might just get them to choose one and we do it as a group um but if you imagine you know if you imagine you're doing these um these kind of exercises for 45 seconds and then 15 seconds you're just pausing bringing your attention to your breath noticing how your body feels you know especially if you've been moving quite fast, you know, sometimes you can feel your legs twitching, you can feel pulses in your body, you can feel your heart maybe slowing down or getting into a more relaxed rhythm. And a bit like the musical statues, then you change the animal when they do something else. And you know, it's fun, they're laughing, it's good. It's, uh, it gives you that boost of endorphins, um, brings some happiness in as well. But it, between each one, you're just teaching them that whenever their breath gets fast, whenever they feel that their body, you know, is acting in a certain way, that they can just stop and things will settle. So it's just constantly teaching them that that is something that they can do. That'd be good for children uh, with ADHD, definitely. Absolutely. I've, I've seen, when you do mindfulness and kind of this type of work with children with ADHD, it's amazing the results you get because... It's like it's just giving them that permission and they're, they're learning that they can just be. And it does have such a such a positive impact. And I, when, when I've done it with children one to one or with families and then even the, even schools have said, you know, it, it was just amazing how they just, you know, we've never seen them do that before, how they were just able to stop and just be in the moment and breathe um, and then just refocus. 
Yeah, it's definitely um, so positive for, for all different children, but yeah, especially children with ADHD um, or even children who have got attachment disorder or attachment difficulties, who are maybe in that um, fight, flight, survival mode all the time. Presents the same, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Very much. Yeah. I've, I've worked with um, one little girl who was addicted to methadone and she had so much trauma, so much attachment difficulties, but she was removed from birth parents as a baby. But obviously the body remembers, the body remembers all of that trauma and all of mm. those difficult emotions. So she was purely in survival mode all the time, like her mind and her body were just reliving the trauma over and over again. So doing things like this, you know, it's about giving them that those strategies to feel safe as well. You know, because when you feel in control, you feel safer, don't you? You, can, you? you just feel like, you know, actually you're in control of your feelings. You're in control of what happens. But when that sense of not being in control kicks in, it's like you just want to get out of there as quick as possible. And a lot of children don't even know that this is going on, do they, in the brain? This is in the subconscious. Um, so absolutely. Um, doing this from an early age for all children is really, really positive. So we've said, you know, using your senses, bring your attention to your breath, which is what we're trying to do. Acknowledge the physical sensations in the body when somebody's still and when they're moving. Notice how quickly the breathing rate changes between movements. Even if you get them to do really slow movements, sometimes I get them to have a balloon and they have to slowly hit one balloon up and hit it in the other hand and just notice how the sensation feels, notice how the balloon feels. You know, it doesn't have to be fast exercise. It can just be really slow movements, but still getting them to bring their attention to that. Whenever your mind wanders away from the present moment, you can bring it back to the breath. So if you're worrying lots of pop-up thoughts, don't do this, this is rubbish, you're, you know, you're a nasty person, so-and-so doesn't like you, all of those thoughts whizzing around. Your thoughts, if you can imagine all of those thoughts in a room, sometimes they would fill it, you wouldn't even have space to breathe. But if you just, if you notice that your mind is wandering to those thoughts, just bring it back to the breath. The breath's with you all the time, focus on the breath, press pause and just be. If it wanders again, bring it back. Sometimes we just use like, a, a, like you know, the bubbles that you blow um, at parties and things like that. Sometimes we try and imagine a bubble, send the thought into the bubble, pop it, disappears, just be. If it comes back in, put it in the bubble, pop it, send it off. Again, it's just about trying to feel in control. Feel your heart beating. So sometimes putting your hand on your chest, noticing how that um, how your breath is, is affecting your heartbeat or feeling your pulse. Feel the rhythm of your feet moving on the ground as, as well. So if you're doing kind of a mindful walk or a barefoot walk, you know, just focusing on the rhythm of your feet. Can you hear the, the movement in your feet? How does it feel in your shoes? Does it feel comfortable? Um, again, just bringing that attention back. Notice if you're tensing up any parts of your body. So I mean, if you say if you're you're getting ready to take a penalty, you're going to be nervous, you're going to be anxious, you're going to be excited. Your body is full of all the, those colours, those shapes, you know, those thoughts. You know, it's about just stopping those thoughts, stopping those kind of difficult feelings, just bringing it back to the breath, refocusing and then going for it. So it's that little bit that you need that just takes a couple of seconds and it works, you know, it only works if you practice it. And there's no point practicing it when you need it because we know that the thinking part of the brain is not even on. So you can't think, I know I'm going to bring my attention to my breath or I'm going to do my, my breathing. You need to be practicing it when you're calm. You know, children practice it, you know, after their dinner or before they go to bed or in the morning, just practice, practice, practice. And then all of a sudden your brain starts to learn it as an automatic response. So if you feel those difficult feelings, it just kicks in. If outside, enjoy the wind against your face and the warmth of your body. So again, bringing your attention to the surroundings. Notice if you feel any different emotions compared to the beginning, which is really good as well to do because if somebody is feeling quite anxious or frustrated, you know, often you find that exercise makes you feel better. 
So focus on how does it make you feel better? What are the emotions I feel now compared to the beginning? What are the physiological sensations that I feel now compared to the beginning? And then yoga, obviously we've said yoga is, is so good. It doesn't, it's not just good for physical well-being, but obviously breath. A lot of yoga is focusing on your breath, the core, balance. Um, you know, often when you're doing yoga and you're doing um a pose, you know, you'll kind of breathe through it and you'll find that actually you can do the pose better the more you breathe. Um, it's really connecting the mind and the body. Meditation and relaxation practice. So we've said, you know, families don't want to do this by themselves. They can just book Cosmic Kids or get kind of a, a, a DVD or something like that. Acceptance of self and others. So it gives you permission to just accept, you know, and just to be. Um, it allows you to be fully present because you're focusing on what you're doing. Specific poses and activities to build, build mindfulness in, but also, you know, when, when you, when you do yoga, often the person, the teacher will actually talk you through, you know, this is good for anxiety and stress, or this is good for this part of the body or different poses relate to different parts of the, of the body, a bit like in reflexology. Um, where I've worked with a reflexologist and the kind of therapy that I offer alongside the reflexology that she uses on the body, they work hand in hand together. You know, it's supporting that whole person holistically. And then I was just gonna give you a few little mindfulness tips and tricks that you can take with you. So I know um, some of you have done mindfulness before, but also, what what I always say to people is is this little sentence here, which is quite powerful when you need it, is if in doubt, breathe out. Because like we said, as long as you're here, you're breathing. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, panicked, stressed, angry, worried, whatever, breathe out. Because if you breathe out, you've got to breathe in. And then you've got to breathe out. And then you've got to breathe in again. And once you start focusing that attention to the breath, you will start to notice that it does actually calm down and you do get into a more relaxed breathing rhythm. So even just having that sentence, if in doubt, breathe out, you kind of have it with you and it gives you that sense of control. I know that if I feel in, in a bad way, you know, I know I can breathe out, I'll be okay, I'm safe. So balloon breathing is a bit like with the breathing buddies, but it kind of teaches our body to get into kind of, a deeper breathing rhythm, which is going to help you feel more relaxed and calm. So often because we're whizzing around or talking or rushing around or whatever, our breath is quite shallow. So it's here. So you'll be breathing like this, quite shallow. And sometimes what you notice is if you put your hands on your stomach, what you might notice is that when you breathe in, your stomach goes in. And then when you breathe out, your stomach goes out again. Well, that's that shallow breathing and that's not what we want our breath to do. We want it to be the opposite. So if you imagine a balloon, what happens is when you blow up a balloon and you fill it with air, you want the balloon to inflate. So you want your stomach to actually go out. And then when you breathe out, it's like letting that balloon down and your hands should come in. So that's another good way of working with children to teach them how to kind of bring that relaxed motion of breathing in because what they what they will probably notice is that they didn't know how to do that and, and even when you start doing it it can be quite difficult because your body wants to do the opposite but the, again the more you practice it if you practice it in bed in the morning you know if you're sitting in the car wherever it really does work and you can change that breath instantly so as you breathe in your stomach will inflate and then you breathe out and your stomach will go down. And if, if, if a child has a teddy or a cushion and they put that on their tummy, when they breathe in, they can physically see the teddy coming up. So it gives them like a guide. So it really helps them to get that control. Um, another one which is really useful, which I'm, I'm gonna tell you about is petal breathing. So again, what you find is when you feel anxious or angry or frustrated, 
your whole body tenses up. So a bit like our gingerbread person, there's a lot of tension all around our body, in our stomach, in our chest. So what happens is when you, when you feel quite tense, it almost like you, you clench your fist. So I'm just gonna ask you to clench your fist. So clench your fist for me. And I don't know about you, but when I clench, clench my fist, it feel like I can't breathe out. It feels like I've got to hold my breath. So what we need to try and teach our bodies and our minds to do is that we can, we can release. So if you open your fist and breathe out, and then what you're trying to do is you're trying to teach your body that when it feels tense and you feel like you've got to hold your breath and you're holding it in, if you imagine it like a, a flower and the petals are opening, again, you're getting that body and that mind back in sync and you're teaching it to, if in doubt, breathe out. It will open, it'll close again, but it will open again. Okay, and having something physically to keep that movement going is really, really good, especially if those thoughts are getting too much and it, everything's consuming you. So petal breathing is a really, really good one. But I will send you those breathing cards because I think they'll be handy for you to have and you can, um, you can make them into cards or you can have them as a sheet. And if you're working with a group of children or a family, it might be helpful to have because they've got all of these different things on there. Okay, so we're coming to the end now. Um, we've just got five minutes left. So at the end of the slide, you'll get lots of links to different resources. Um, different things that you can share with families, children that you work with. If you are looking for emotional literacy books on a certain topic to support children, this website here, littleparachutes.com, is really, really good because say if you're working with a, a child who's going through a parent separation, you can put that in, you can select the age, and it gives you a list of suitable books. So it's really, it's a kind of a really handy helpful um, resource and then I've just included uh, the mood stars link as well you might use similar mine are in the background I don't know if you can see them it's just like a little board with some felt stars and they have different emotions on and if you're supporting families or a group of children with their emotions it can be handy just to have those kind of visuals but you don't have to buy the mood stars you could just make your own cards out of emojis or adapt it to their interests if they're interested in dinosaurs or princesses or whatever you know you can really or lego faces you can adapt it to whatever they kind of interested in and there's some other links there about trauma in the brain and um, fight flight and freeze as well if you wanted to read up any more about that and then i always say to everybody you know if you do put anything into place from this training or anything that you want to share, then please do send it to me because it's always helpful to share good practice and to, you know, again, raise awareness of all the wonderful things you're doing. Um, and then this is just some information about our wellbeing centre in Anstey and some of the things that um, we offer. The other thing that we're offering next year is the low sensory hairdressing barber service, because I know a lot of autistic children and children with sensory processing find that really difficult. So it's a safe space that they can come, you know, it's not got the typical sit in this chair, the noise, wear this gown, you know, it's really informal and relaxed, calm environment. But um, yeah, that's just some of the services that we offer as well. So yeah, normally I just say, if you've got any feedback, then you can put it in the chat or you can send it over. And I'm really grateful, you know, giving up your time on this Wednesday evening. It's been an, a small group, but hopefully you've still got a lot out of it. And it's just useful to gain a bit more knowledge and share some ideas. So thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Shirley. That was um, really informative. So I suppose it's a it's quite a new area for me around early years, but so mm -hmm. important to see the link between that that physical side as well. And I really like the self-regulation hit workout. I definitely yeah. in that. Um, I'm just going to stop recording um, now.